um, yeah, big Sunday, really awesome Sunday. I'm really excited because God is up to something yeah. in the house of God. God is moving. He's, yeah. he's, 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 he's um, not just moving, but he has plans for what he wants to do. And how many know we're not too worried about God moving? Sometimes it's, um, it's God worried about us moving. <laughs> Because sometimes God can tell you to go, and we're like this. God's going to say, just go, come on, take a step. And we're just not taking steps, we're being stubborn. And, and a lot of times we're not, God's not, we're not waiting on God to move. He's waiting on us to move. But this series, we're in the middle of a series of messages called One Small Step. We're not in the middle, we're on the back end actually. This is week five of One Small Step series. Has it been helpful for you? Yeah. Three people. Awesome. I'm going to go home and cry at night. No, I'm just kidding. Has it been okay? Has God been talking to you? Been blessing you? Um, you know what? If you like to binge TV series, okay, because a series, if you're like not up with the church lingo, it's just a collection of messages, right, that we string together that are around a specific theme or topic. And this theme or topic that we've been looking at for five weeks, including tonight, has been the topic of faith. Faith, and you know what? I, I just every single week I've come to preparing this message and praying and asking God, what do you have for our church for this next season and next message? Um, every time I, I preach, I feel like God's anointing is just being all over it. You're good whenever you want grace. I'm not going to preach long tonight because we have communion and all this exciting stuff, and um, I'm just excited because God's going to do something tonight. But I really believe. We've been talking about faith this series, okay? Oh, yeah, by the way, you can go back and watch them on YouTube because yeah. we record them. Hey, Harrison, this is for a friendly reminder because I forgot to remind you before church, but I'm sure he is because he's awesome. But this series has been on faith, and I felt God's anointing be all over it every single week, over the praise, the worship, the word, even as I'm preparing it. I'm like, God, it feels like your power and your anointing and your favor is just all over these messages. And I was saying to Benny this week, I'm like, you know what, it feels like we're about to end this series tonight on faith, one small step. But I kind of said to, to Benny, I said, I don't think God's done with this yet. Like there's some series that are like series and it's good and it's nice and that was awesome and God spoke to me. And there's some like foundational things, foundational messages, foundational things. And I, I said to Benny, I said, this is the end of this series, but I don't think this is the end of this concept yeah. in our life, in our church. Yeah. And I, I feel like the idea of having faith faith, like the, the confident expectation that God is going to come through yeah. and believe in God for things bigger than what we can see, having a vision that's big, but taking yeah. small steps of faith. And I believe that I said, I don't know how this series is going to pop up. Maybe it'll be a book one day or a, or a, a, a song, or maybe it'll be a, a theater, like a project. I don't know what it will look like, but I really believe that this idea of faith, and I was thinking this week, I think the reason that God his, his touch has been all over this last five weeks, this series, yeah. is because the Bible says that it is impossible to please God without faith. In other words, He is pleased when His people have faith. And we've been talking about faith, we've been discussing faith, and I just felt His anointing all over it. You know, we've looked at the flex space. That was week one and the faith space and we talked about purposely like intentionally like making it in our calendar a space where faith is needed not just like it would be nice but god if you don't come through in this area i don't have this plan b or if god doesn't work it out i've got this extra funds over here or this extra i've got a backup plan no actually saying god this is the space if you don't move it doesn't move and creating that space. And, you know, we shared some of our story that we've been living in that space. And I'm, just this week, we had some new man. God has come through, okay? God has come through. He is filling every flex space that you create. We we looked at sacrifice because faith takes sacrifice sometimes. It takes a giving up. And we looked at the message, you've got to give up in order to go up. And how Paul often gave up health and comfort and security and serenity and, and, and peace. And he gave up all these things, but it promoted him. God used what he gave up. And we realize that fire, the presence of God, the anointing of God, always falls on sacrifice. That it was Jesus who said, if anyone gives up mother or brother or sister, all well, the brothers like, yeah, I'll give my sister up. 
uh, any brother, you know, a field or Instagram or Spotify playlist or watching habits or time habits. If anyone gives anything up to me because of my name and the gospel, I will return it back to them tenfold. And he says both in this life and the next life to come. So fire always falls on sacrifice. We looked at how it's going to take one step of obedience at a time, step by step by step by step, where you don't have to understand step seven before you take step one. Just take step one. This is an overview, you know, previously on one small step series. And then last week, man, the power of one. The power, and we had a line of people, and it's just an example. And, you know, sometimes we use the example of inviting someone to church, and, and that's awesome. Do it. But it's more than that. It's, it's bigger than that. It's, it's the power of one. You've got the opportunity to start a domino, domino line effect of God's kingdom moving in people's lives outside of the church and in your workplace, sharing the gospel, the power of one, that the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, like in you, inside of you, the same power that took a lifeless, dead, lungs shriveled up, heart still, body of Jesus in a tomb, uh, the same power that caused woo, blood to flow and, 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 and breath to come back again and his body to get up out of the grave, Spartan kick a stone out of the way and, and walk out of the grave. The same power that did all of that lives in you. And the power of just one. And so tonight, I was praying, God, how do you want me to end this? You know, the series. We're not ending a life of faith. I've upgraded from a napkin, guys. How do you want me to end this? And I felt him say, Kira, I want you to help the people move. Everyone say move. move. Turn your neighbor and say move. move. No, seriously, you're sweaty. You stick it out. <laughs> move. And so this message is my last ditch attempt to say, you've got to move. <laughs> your voice wants to move. You've got to move. You've got to do something. Don't just hear the word. God's been calling you and directing you and asking you and challenging you and saying, hey, take a step. Come on, now's the time. This is the time. Now is the moment. Take a move, take a move, take a move, take a step, take a step. And some of us are okay, just not take a step. So this message tonight is for anyone that's like, yeah, I'm going to take a step. Yeah, next week. yeah, I'm going to take that step of faith. Yeah, I'm going to give that amount. Yeah, I'm going to invite that person. Yeah, I'm going to do this or do that. Or I'm going to reach out to that, you know, uh, family member that I haven't talked to before. Like, I, yeah, I'm going to do all of that. God's asking you to take a step. This is the message that I'm praying. When you leave, it will help you to move. To move. The fruit of faith, the result of faith, is more faith. When you have faith, you have a faith for God to move, right? To do something. And when He does it, the result of that faith is, is more faith in your life. I think about David on the battlefield facing off Goliath. And he says, you know what? I fought the lion and I fought the bear. And I had faith in that area. And because I had this little faith... I can have faith for this big thing. The result wasn't he didn't stop fighting battles. It's just his faith got stronger. Yeah. And so the result, I'm praying you leave this series with more faith. Yeah. You don't graduate from needing faith. You just need more. Yeah. And so I, I don't know what sort of vision you have for your life. I don't sort of know what sort of big thing you're believing God for. But I believe that if you've seen God do it before and you had faith back then when it was a small thing or an easy thing, the result of that is like, yeah, God can do it. Yeah, He will do it. Yeah, He did do it. Yeah, He is able. And, and I am enough through Jesus. I can do it. And, and the result of what He did there is more faith here. So I don't know what you need, but why don't you remember the things that God did do? And that causes more faith in your life. If you want faith for the big things, you've got to start with faith. In the, in the little things. So tonight, we're going to go to the master teacher, Jesus, okay? This guy's an a, a crazy teacher. He's a master teacher. We're going to one of his sermons here in the book of Matthew. And what we're about to read is a parable, okay? Now, if you're not familiar with Bible terminology, that's fine. Parable is just um, it's a made-up story to illustrate a kingdom truth. 
Okay, it's just a story that he just created out of nowhere. It doesn't exist. The, the, the prodigal son wasn't a real son. It's just a made up figment of Jesus, Jesus' imagination. And that's what I sort of love about Alabaster. A lot of the shows that we do aren't like Esther the Musical. You know, we did Mosaic. That's a real story. It's Christmas. But it's not like David the Musical. A bit. It's a made up story to illustrate a truth about God. And so in this uh, parable, this story, Jesus begins to make up this story. We read it in Matthew chapter 25. Young Z will help me out here. Matthew, the book of Matthew, because we've got to stir up some faith in here, okay? Just keep this liturgy going the whole time. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, uh, starting. <clears throat> I'll wait to you at the level. 14, verse 14. Okay. Alright, we'll work on that, guys. It's good. So Jesus says this, okay? He says, again, now, often Jesus would share multiple parables that different stories that all point to the same truth. Think the lost son, the lost sheep, uh, the lost coin. Three different stories all talking about how God loves to seek and save the lost. Okay, So this is one of a trilogy of Jesus' stories. Okay, And when he says it will be like, the it he's referring to is the kingdom of God. If you read further up in the chapter, he's saying the kingdom of God is like. Okay, So he says again, it will be like, the kingdom of God will be like a man, or other translations say a master will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and trusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. We'll call him Mr. Five. To the other, two bags, Mr. Two. And to another, someone say one. One. He just got one. He, he, he just had one bag. One, one, one thing. God gave him one step, one thing to do. One bag of gold. And each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five bags, he went at once and put his money to work and gave five bags more. Good day on the stock market. And so also, the one with the two bags of gold gave two more. Good time in Bitcoin or something like that. But the man who had received just one bag, he went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned to settle accounts with them. The man who had received five bags and uh, brought the gold and the other five said, Master... I had a good day out of the, you know, trading and selling and all that. And you would trust me from the five. Check it out. I've got five more for you. Here's ten bags of gold. Sweet. His master says, well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. And I'll put you in charge of many things. Come, let's party. The man with the two bags of gold said, okay, master. Uh, he said, you would trust me with the two. See, I've gained two more. How does Jesus like his steak? Well done. <laughs> Well done, he says, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received just the one bag of gold came and said, Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. In other words, I know you're a hustle. I know you like to hustle. You get, to get on your grind. I know you like to get things done. I know you're a hard dude. And so he says, I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. That's a message right there. See, here is what belongs to you. And he gave him this one bag of gold left. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So that when I return, I would at least receive it back with interest. Turn to your neighbor and say the title of the message. Now, part five, one small step. Turn to them and say, make a move. Come on, say it aggressively. Make a move. Turn to your neighbor and say, you two, make a move. All right, yeah, okay. Let's pray right now. Let's pray. Let's ask Jesus to help us. Jesus, we want you to move. But we want to move too. Help us to act on what you're teaching us. Help us not to have closed off hearts in this message tonight. But to move. Help us cool down physically. In Jesus' name, amen. I hate driving in the city. I hate I hate driving in the city. Many of you know that I'm terrible with directions. Um, I'm terrible with geometry. I mean geography. Sorry. I hate driving in the city. And I was thinking this week about why do I hate driving in the city? And I, it stemmed back. I had a self-reflection. I remember this one time. Bethany and I were on our way to premarital counselling. Premarital counselling, nothing wrong, okay? It's the good thing that you do before marriage. 
So we're going into the city to meet with this um, counselor, premarital counselor. And we're driving in there in our green Hyundai XL that I paid $500 for. And we're driving in there and we start to get to the point of the city where the streets are getting close together and tight and it's hard. The streets are one way and some are, and, and, and we're starting to get lost. We're starting to make wrong turns. Wrong turn after, we're following the GPS that, you know, eight years ago it wasn't as good as it is now. But, you know, the streets are so close together so it would think we're on this street but we're really on this street so we take the wrong turn. And anyway, we're driving and things are starting to get like a bit tense in the car. Things are getting a bit tense between the lovebirds. And so, we're driving, it's like, oh, is it this way? It's like, yep, turn left, no left, yep, right, left, left, left. Why are you turning right? And so we're turning, and then we're getting angrier and angrier at each other. I'm not even joking, we are fighting now in the car, on the way to premarital counseling. And we're getting angry. we keep making a wrong turn after a wrong turn, and we end up going this way, and it's the GPS is saying the other way, and we think we're on that street, and then we'll catch up to here, and we're fighting, and we're getting angrier and angrier and angrier until eventually we just decide to pull in, and we go to our safe space. M McDonald's car park, okay? We pull into McDonald's, and we're like, oh, the golden arches, somewhere we know. And we pull in there, and we have a cheeseburger, and by this time, we're getting later and later, we've missed our appointment. We don't want to miss our appointment, but we miss our appointment because we're just lost in the city at some random um, heaven sent McDonald's. And we're sitting there eating our cheeseburger, and then we call the premarital counselor. We're like, listen, we're not going to make it, but I think it's okay. We've already done like a bit of the work today. Uh, you can book us in for next time, but can you still check our appointment off? Because we've got a lot of stuff worked through on this car trip. And we're just making wrong turn after wrong turn after wrong turn. I was thinking about this week. I'm like, I think that's why I'm so scared to go into the city to drive because I'm afraid of making a wrong turn. But then I was thinking, the Holy Spirit saying, you know what? Our faith is a little bit like that too. Sometimes we can be so scared of doing the wrong thing that we become suffocated by safety and never end up doing anything. You see, even to this day, if I can avoid going into the city, I will avoid going into the city. If it's an event or something, if I can go with someone else, I'll always harass him. I'm always going in the car with him if it's somewhere in that direction because I just don't want to drive in the city because I'm still afraid of making the wrong turn. But how many times in our faith we're like, I, I, I don't know what the right thing to do is, so you just end up doing nothing. And if the premise and the crux of this message is this, do something. Do something with what God has given you. You don't even have to know if it's the exact right move to make. Just move. Just do something with what God's given you. Don't just sit and be suffocated by safety. Don't be afraid by making a wrong turn. You see, Peter, he was in the boat. And Jesus called him out onto the water and he started to take some steps, right? He started to take some steps, but the moment that he stopped, he sunk. The moment that he saw the wind and the waves, I don't know how you see wind, but okay. He saw the waves, felt the wind, and he got scared. And he stopped and he sunk. I don't want to be a church, I don't want to be a, a person who is suffocated by the need to be safe. To think, I don't know what the right thing to do is, so I'm just going to do nothing. That's not how faith works. You don't actually know the exact step every time. Sometimes you get a clear way from God. Awesome. But sometimes you don't actually know. But I want to encourage us to make a move. I want to highlight this verse that he says here. He says, I was afraid and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. I was afraid and I went out and I hid what you gave me in the ground. And I was thinking about this and I felt the Holy Spirit say, hey man, just don't play it safe. Don't play it safe with your steps. Don't try and you see, we spend a lot of time studying our steps and scrutinizing our steps and speculating other people's steps and, and, and thinking about should I do this? But we do all of that but never actually take any steps of faith. 
we think about it, this would be a good move, and strategize this and do that and see what that person's doing, we won't try that. You know, take it, we, we end up thinking a lot, but never doing anything. And I don't want to live in fear making the wrong move. You see, when I was teaching Oscar to ride the bike, I had to try and teach him that if you want to move, you know, change direction, you can't do it standing still. It's easier for God to adjust the direction of your steps while you're moving. It's easier, just start taking the steps of faith. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying just take whatever steps you want, whatever feels good for you. There's two things that qualify a step of faith, and that's one, it's written in black and white in the Word of God. If it's a step that moves away from something the Word of God says, then that's a step that's like, you shouldn't take that step, okay? Because Jesus clearly says, don't do that. And the other step of faith is uh, we belong to a body. We're together. We're connected. We're, we're part of one another's lives. And so isolated steps aren't a good idea either. But, but when you've got the, the Word of God and the body of God coming together and saying, yeah, those steps were good, don't stand and think it might not be the exact right thing. Should you go to college, uh, uh, Bible college? Should you join that job? Should you meet that thing or do that? What? I don't know. Just do something. Should you join this team? Should you give that an app? I don't know, but just do something. It's easier for God to change the direction of your steps while you're going. You see, Paul one time experienced this. He was on his way on the missionary field. You'd think that's the right step. Doesn't matter which mission, just go. And Paul was going, taking steps, and then the Bible says that a door closed. But he wouldn't have known that the door closed to that country if he hadn't made steps to the door and he got redirected to another place. Just do something with what God has given you. Do something with the gold He's given in you, the talents He's given you, the skills He's given you, the opportunity He's given you, the friends He's given you, the family, the position, the work, the place, the influence. Just do something. The worst thing you can do is nothing. You see, I was thinking about this guy and I'm starting to feel a bit sorry for him because it's like, it's not like he did the wrong thing. Right? He didn't do the wrong thing. It's not about him doing the wrong thing. It's the fact that he did no thing. That he just took the gold and he put it in the ground. And then I read the master's response. And he said, you wicked and lazy servant. First of all, I thought, geez, Jesus. Jesus. And that's not a curse word. That's me questioning Jesus. That's a bit harsh. I'd just like to point out that wicked and lazy are in the same sentence. We often just think, yeah... Lazy, but that's not bad. Yeah, it's not good, but it's not bad. Oh, wicked. It's kind of bad. <laughs> and again, uh, you wicked and lazy servant. And I'm thinking, that's a bit harsh, Jesus, because this, this poor boy, he, it's not like he lost the money. He didn't steal the money. That would be wicked. He didn't waste it off gambling or something. He didn't waste the money, steal the money. And by one person's standard, he'd say he did an all right job. He took it, he kept it safe, he put it in the ground. A lot of people in antiquity would put their gold in the ground for safekeeping. And, and so he did an all right job by someone's standards, but apparently by God's standards. So I don't want to encourage you, I your steps, not just a good idea, the, the saying goes, but is it a God idea? Is it up to God's standard? Is it, it, see, the master, and here's the most annoying thing in this story for me, is the master never even said... Go and invest. He didn't even say, go, I expect to get more. He just gave it to him and left. These two other Mr. Five and Mr. Two show-offs, they go the ones that go and, you know, get more back. And Mr. One's playing it safe. But apparently it wasn't about instruction. It was about instinct. He's saying, I, I, I want you to increase this thing. I want you to grow this thing. I want you to do something. Don't just put it in the ground. Don't just, just hide it away and play it safe. I would rather you lose it then do nothing with it. I'd rather you be hot or cold, Jesus says. But don't sit in the middle and just, you can't decide if you want the air conditioner in the car on fully cold or fully hot. Don't put it in that middle gross vomit temperature. Don't do that. He says, do something with it. Do something with what I've given you. God said it. See, he's not interested in what we think is a good idea. I think it would be a good idea to keep this safe and Put it down, but make a move. Make a move. I want us to be careful that we don't end up with a lazy faith. 
lazy faith. Lazy faith. Because the Bible says that after a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. And so maybe some of you, you're feeling like God's asking you to take a step. And maybe you've said, God, I feel like you're asking me to take this step. I feel like you're asking me to do this thing, but I'm just going to wait on it. And there are seasons where you should just wait on God. Don't get me wrong. But for some of you, God's given you direction. He's given you the next step. He's given you something to do. And you say, I'm just going to wait on it. I'm just going to sit on it for a while. I'll just sit on it for a couple of years. I'll sit on it till my kids are older. I'll just sit on it until I have more money. I'm just going to sit on it till I finish school. I'm just going to sit on that for a while. I'm just going to wait on that. But I want to encourage you, you might wait on the Word, but sometimes the Word isn't going to wait on you. The Master says He's coming back. Here's the thing I want to tell you. Sometimes your step is time sensitive. Because we think the promises of God are yes and amen, so I don't have to do anything and they'll just come when they come. No, God's saying sometimes the promise has an expiry date. The other week we talked about Abraham going up the mountain with his son. He had a word from God. Take your son up the mountain and sacrifice him there. That's a word from God. I'm thankful, and Abraham was thankful that that word expired. Does that make sense? And he got a new word, but he took the steps. So tonight, don't just wait on God. God, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. Don't have a lazy faith because what we do is we have a lazy faith, but then we cover it up with Christian lingo. We cover it up with like, well, God, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'll wait till I have a peace about it. Well, God said that don't cover up bad lifestyle with Christian lingo or lazy faith where you're just stubborn with, with a nice Christian word. Amen. And don't, don't just like, let's have a faith that says, I'm going to step, I'm going to move, I'm going to make a move. I don't know if it's the right move, I don't know if it's the best move, but I'm going to do something with what God's given me. I'm going to do something with the kids that He's given me. I'm going to do something with this job that He's given me. I'm going to do something with this paycheck, this friendship. I'm going to do something with what God has given me. I'm not just going to hide it and hoard it and keep it and put it in the ground and do nothing with it. My my time, my step is time sensitive. I, I want to do something. I don't want to squander this step. I don't want to squander this season. I don't want to waste it away waiting for, I know, 100%, 100%, 10 out of 10. 10 pink cars in a row and then a bird fell on it. That's the word from God. You're never going to get that. Sometimes it's just a step. And if it's the wrong step, that's okay. Because God can redeem it. And He can shift it. He can move you. Now don't take a step into sin. He can redeem that. That's fine. But just take a step of faith and start moving and God will align you as you go. Why don't we stand up in this place? Ben, join me. I don't know maybe who this message was for, but you've been awaiting for the right time. You've been waiting for the right moment. You've been sitting where you have should be stepping. And tonight this is for you. God says, don't wait on it any longer. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your opportunity. Make a move. This is the time. This is the moment. This is the opportunity. Make a move.